it all sort of fell together that a life in the art is something that you make up. Yeah. Running away from demons, running it toward the unknown mm -hmm. is how I understand it. Welcome to The New Conversation. I'm Dwight McBride, president of The New School. The New Conversation is a series where I converse with distinguished writers, thinkers, creators, and doers about their work, their life experience, and their perspective on some of the most important issues of our time. Today's guest is none other than Bill T. Jones, Tony Award-winning choreographer, artistic director of New York Live Arts, and the co-founder of Bill T. Jones' Arnie Zane Company. He's a gifted choreographer, and performer, and writer, and director. And we're very glad to have him here with us this year as a presidential visiting scholar at the New School. Bill, welcome, my friend. Thank you. Delighted to have you. Great to be here. And especially on your birthday, I understand. Yes. Happy birthday. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Well, listen, I want to jump right in. Um, the first question I have is one that I ask everyone who sits in this chair, and that is, um, when did you first know that you wanted to be doing this work, being a choreographer? And was there ever anything else that you thought you might be? Well, it's a wonderful question, but uh, you know, I don't think there was this aha moment. There was something about coming from a family that was an African-American family, migrant workers, mm -hmm. living in the hills of upstate New York. Mm -hmm. um, most people there were, everyone was itinerant. Yeah. Even we were. And then settling down, my dad becomes a black Yankee. And uh, so I had the good fortune of being in a stable community, K through 12. Mm -hmm. Somewhere in there, the school system, they hired a drama teacher. Oh. And of course, no one heard of dance. You know, dance was, there was rumors that in the town 10 miles away, <laughs> there were tap classes, but dance as we know it or ballet, no. But there was this woman who was feisty. Her name was Mary Lee Shapey. You know, she could be scary, but you know, being the the, the black kid mm -hmm. in a class of white kids, yeah. and you want to perform, you want to be liked, yeah. and so on. But she she saw me, and she cut through that. She formed drama club, and drama club. I had a chance to get up and show off, which is what I wanted to do. And maybe when the, I don't know what happened, but. In my senior year in high school, she allowed me to direct Arthur Miller's The Crucible. Really? Yeah, I wasn't sure what was going on there, but I think it said something that, about her implicit faith in me. Now that's not saying, oh, he's gonna go be a choreographer. No, yeah, no, yeah. I don't think, there was no dance there. But it did give me the confidence that the stage was someplace that I could find the truth. And I thought, of course, I was going to New York City and I was going to become a, a what was there other than Broadway? Yeah. Did I know there was such a thing as modern dance? Yeah. No. Yeah. So there was no aha moment. Mm. There was a time, and this story I've told so many times, I was in the, uni or the university, State University of New York at Binghamton. I was a runner. I was not a bad runner. Mm -hmm. uh, but there was a time when there was a lot of ferment. Uh, there, were, there was a lot of mixing going on. Mm -hmm. My niece, Marion Young, who was my age, said to me, Billy, don't go to the track practices. You gotta check out these African dance classes. And so uh, I said, African dance classes? Well, she said, you gotta check it out. Uh -huh. So I told my coach, who was very, he said, well, well, you'll be maintaining your cardiovascular, so I guess it's okay. <laughs> Little did he know, he'd just given me away oh. to, uh, and I went to that, those classes, and there was something that was transformative, not to mention that the teacher was a big, charismatic black mm. man who was mm. Percival Board, who was the husband, the estranged husband of the mm. great Pearl Primus, oh, wow. and he was, this is what a black man looks like. Now, he was moving in a particular style, but this, I'd never had a, a, a teacher who was a black man. Uh, he was not a cuddly one, yeah. Oh, he, yeah. and he was the cock of the walk in the room. In other words, he had to put you down so that he could strut among the young ladies. Yeah. All this stuff was going on, but the fact is, he was an artist dancer. Yeah. And then I met Arnie Zane. Wow. I met Arnie Zane, who had been living in Amsterdam, and there was a lot of things about culture and art, and uh, he, uh, he encouraged me to go to Amsterdam. Mm -hmm. 
This is a way of saying it all sort of fell together that a life in the art is something that you make up. Yeah. Running away from demons, running it toward the unknown mm -hmm. is how I understand it. I love that. Running away from the demons and running toward the unknown. Yes, yeah. right. You are not the first <clears throat> to say, sitting in this chair to say something very similar about art. I love oh, really? that. Yeah. yeah. I want to switch veins just a little bit. You are spending time, and thank you for this, as a presidential visiting scholar here this year mm -hmm. uh, with us at the new school. I know you've been doing the bill chats and mm -hmm. have brought those. Um, in partnership with this, and those have been, I, I attended the last one myself, fantastic. The biggest things we're doing are the build chats, mm -hmm. and uh, these, uh, a piece entitled uh, Continuous Replay, which is actually a very successful piece of Arnie Zane's, mm -hmm. that when he died, I restaged, and it's now become uh, a very important tool, teaching tool in the company, mm. and many universities are, are, are doing it. So Fantastic. that, and my uh, my associate, Janet Wong, who is the co-artistic director. Well, I met briefly at the Bill Chat. She oh, was there well, too, yeah. Well, she, w yeah. Janet makes things happen. <laughs> she is the one who decides who the teachers are. Mm -hmm. She was part of the selection process with the students and all. And I will be going into a class within the next couple of weeks um, to see what they're doing, yeah. you know, and, 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 and tell some stories. And I mean, what do they, this, this, is, this is what my respect for academia mm -hmm. right now. Academia is a place that, is it about questions being answered or about the right questions being poised? Mm -hmm. And what is, what, what is a, an artist's legacy? Mm -hmm. Arnie Zane is gone now. He died in mm -hmm. March of 1988. But we still, his name is evoked all the time. And with it comes a story, story of, of an interracial partnership. Now he, and, he was a Jewish man, um, an African-American man, story about uh, gayness, mm -hmm. story about uh, HIV AIDS, mm -hmm. because uh, we were caught right in the middle of all that. Oh, yeah. So to talk about his work, and in some ways, I've said that Continuous Replay is one of our last public aesthetic conversations. Oh, wow. or even though yeah. I staged the work after he was gone, right now you feel very strongly his imprint, but you see how I inflected it and uh, inserted myself into it. It's been really the exciting. The interplay is still there. The yeah. interplay yeah. is still and there. Very smart people here, yeah. very smart people. It's interesting because um, when you ask whether it's about the uh, questions being posed or the um, or whether it's about the answers, mm -hmm. um, the thing that always draws me, and I think that I think that draws uh, the art that I'm most drawn to, mm -hmm. um, is that they're asking questions that seem to be um, almost perpetually of interest, right? That's the questions, generously put, <laughs> right? Um, have a kind of staying power to them, right? Because they're not the easy, I mean, if it's good art, it's good work, mm -hmm. they're not asking easy questions about humanity, right? Oh, they're the hard things. mean like the, those persons like yourself, the faculty or the students themselves? So I think both. I mean, for me, if you're, if you're in the classroom especially, and this is what I love about teaching, the magic of teaching, is the discovering of not just the answers are, are, they're just not interesting to me. I mean, they're, because they're multiple. <laughs> you, you'll have an answer, I'll have, and they're all important, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. But the question, right, if it's a really powerful question, it doesn't have easy answers. There is, like Haley's comment, yeah. through all of these, what you call these eternal questions, mm -hmm. there will be a genius. Oh, who yeah. will, and you've got to be ready for that. But for the most part, it is, in a way, trying to, I feel, trying to get people to respect what they, what has already been done. Yeah. Now, yeah. particularly in a form like American Modern Dance, mm -hmm. if you will, it seems so strange that formulation, since at New York Live Arts, we don't call it dance, we call it embodied investigation. Mm -hmm. But for, let's go back to the time when I came to school, American Modern Dance was predicated on the idea that there was something progressive people had new ideas, new styles, new ways of being on stage. Mm -hmm. And uh, then the question of identity, who is on stage yeah. and what are they doing? What are they trying to do? Now that is probably the most important one to me right now is teaching students respect for the history, 
but at the same time saying, and who the hell are you? Mm -hmm. yeah. And, and yeah. why are you here? Uh, a friend of mine who has um, uh, been long been an admirer of your work uh, said to me, you know, the thing that I find so impressive is that is the variety of bodies that he puts on the stage. Mm -hmm. It's been one of the things that you've, again, been interrogating, right? Mm -hmm. um, is what is what is a dancer? It's a big part of what I see in the work. Um, and I think you're absolutely right about um, young people, um, particularly when I was teaching graduate students. Graduate students in my discipline is uh, literary studies, they're very good at taking things apart, right? Mm -hmm. um, and my question to them always is to take them back to those texts and to say, where was he in history? What were the discussions that he was participating in and intervening in? Mm -hmm. Now I want to think about what in that moment was he bringing that was new? Well, because it works better for literature. It, it works not, better for literature, it does not absolutely. Work for performing arts. Because performing arts that night, when that light comes on, the first somebody could die on that stage. And that is the kind of respect we have to have for live performance. I said that to them. Uh, Maya Angelou, who was a friend, I suppose, a mentor, if you would, she said, if you want to know, her grandmother would say to her, if you want to know the effect that you have in this world, and she would take a bucket of water, and she'd say, stick your hand in there. Mm -hmm. Now take it out. Do you see your... She said, that is what uh, being in this world is like. You put your hand in the water, you take it out, there, you, you're not there. Now, that's a truth, yeah. but that yet we have this idea that we're supposed to be giving our best effort to make every moment that we have the audience's attention uh, rife with possibility, challenge, life, and that is something that you learn when they are sweating in the room together, when they actually have to put themselves vulnerable and naked in front of other people. How do you solve that question of I am insignificant, but yet I'm not? Now, that's a conundrum. Absolutely. That I think all artists wrestle with that, but particularly those of us in the performing, in the performing arts. arts. Yeah. I want to change gears one more time uh, and talk specifically um, about um, one of the more recent works that your company has done, and that's curriculum, which mm -hmm. seems appropriate given that we're in an academic context. Um, Although the title was a bit tongue-in-cheek. Oh, I know. I was going to ask you about it, but why don't you say a little bit of what, well, why that the, is? Well, yeah. the, 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 uh, the, the context of the answer, which is usually a story, mm -hmm. which is a problem, <laughs> life is a story. Reading some years ago um, the work of uh, the great uh, scholar, philosopher, uh, Ashil Mbembe, mm -hmm. who has worked here a lot, right? Oh, and, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, and he was being, it was just an article that was actually brought to me by Janet Wong uh -huh. as we were researching, and he was being interviewed by a writer from Norway because he was going to be lecturing at the University of Bergen. Mm -hmm. Now the conversation was such that the, the writer, I believe it was Norwegian, said, well, what should these young students from the North know about the South, the Southern, the, the, the world of the Southern Hemisphere. And, you know, I don't, I've, re I've read and I think I know the things that he was talking about then, but more importantly, the question said to me, oh, well, there could be a kind of curriculum that one needs to know to be a well-rounded world citizen mm -hmm. right now. Now, of course, in the way that my mind works, it was associative and it was a bit uh, ironic can one really know how to be a good person? Mm -hmm. Can one really know how to deal with uh, planetary change mm -hmm. and social justice? I've been doing a version of something like that my whole life, but if I call a work curriculum, people will expect that it's going to be organized mm -hmm. and it's going to be uh, for some sort of a purpose. The title is a, is, is a deflection what does the heart and the mind of a sensitive person need to engage with to be alive in this world or maybe even thinking about your children's world? Mm -hmm. And that is why um, curriculum as it is uh, right now, the piece that I just recently did at New York Live Arts, 
The first version of it was informed by Greta Thunberg saying, how so dare you? It was curriculum one and curriculum two. Yes, it yeah. never made the light of day because uh -huh. of COVID. Right. And it was going to be, I wanted to, I was fine, trying to find a way that somebody, how can I do a hologram? And he had that young, that slight <laughs> uh, Scandinavian woman wow. show in the middle of a live performance, mm -hmm. how dare you? And that's where it started. And I was going to be talking about broadcast and so on. But um, one night, sitting somewhere, I don't know, probably <laughs> in a hotel or maybe watching uh, a program, but then there is this ticker tape that runs across the bottom of the screen. <laughs> that image of the, of the Bloomberg ticker tape, you might find it dis distracting, but I bet you're expert at doing it. Oh, and we've, oh, we've been tra they've trained exactly. us to do it. Yeah. Exactly. And coming from an art form, which is like contemporary movement dance, um, the audience is supposed to sit in some sort of sacrosanct space, darkened theater, and it all, it's all happening here. And I said, well, how is that different than me watching television? On television, I'm expected to give my attention, but at the same token, there's all this other information. How could I make a theater experience that had that level of interruption going on? And what would be the things that were being interrupted? Are we, can we watch a history lesson about uh, black culture and at the same time, be aware of artificial intelligence. Mm -hmm. And can we actually, the images that we see in the television, the um, riots, animal shows, all, all of those things, they're also there at that moment as well, but we can edit them out as we're watching. What if I made a performance that those things were allowed to penetrate? Mm -hmm. And penetrate is a very important mm -hmm. uh, word for me, being a spatial artist. Mm -hmm. How can we take theater space and actually make it at once porous and as, um, how do you, what would you call the space of the, of the screen? It, it, it suggests a, a world within a world. Yeah. I want to do a piece where the audience is implicated in the work. So we designed the stage so that the audience sits and there are chairs that are Un unoccupied. Mm -hmm. Those are the chairs the dancers will inhabit. Mm. They prefer to be called performers now. Mm -hmm. Because as you know, Bill T. Jones Arnie Zane Dance Company became Bill T. Jones Arnie Zane Company mm -hmm. because it's my hope to develop an ensemble that can handle movement, text, and music with, uh, uh, with facility. So these it. performers are coming, somebody's panting right next to you in the way that dancers do, that you don't usually, usually as an audience see, mm -hmm. because they go off stage, that's happening right next to you. And then they do this thing, there's, suddenly they are performing. A moment ago they were with you, now they're there. And I like that push and pull that makes people understand that this is not a passive activity that you're involved in. Years ago in, in touring, mm -hmm. my dancer Roz LeBlanc, who is now a filmmaker and head of the department, uh, uh, at uh, Loyola, Marymount. 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 Mm -hmm. She, a um, young dancer, we were touring somewhere and she came, I could see she looked tired the next day. She said, I, I couldn't sleep, you know. And I had a revelation. Watching television is more, is more passive than doing nothing. Wow, out of the mouth of babes. Wow. You know, it's more passive than doing nothing. And uh, so I think about that passivity when I'm in a Broadway theater. Yeah. When I'm watching Netflix, I'm thinking about what COVID did to me. Now, what is what should I be filling that time with? What should I be? It's you know? so interesting to hear you talk about um, the, trying to sort of disrupt that passivity um, in the theater through the art form itself, and I'm. I am one, and I'll just admit, I'm one of those audience members who does not like to be included in the performance. You cringe. Oh, oh my God, please don't do pull not me up on let stage. them break that, <laughs> that wall. I don't, I, you know, I want to, I want to take it in. I want to be, mm -hmm. a, you know, not a participant, but an observer. Um, I, the remove is important because sometimes it can, again, great art can also be very, um, emotionally disruptive, right? I mean, in, a, in, a, in, a, in the most powerful and, and, and fecund way, right? But it, 
the, the idea of being involved in the performance in mm. any way makes me extraordinarily nervous. So let's, let's talk yeah. about this for a moment, the edge of things. Yeah. Uh, you're an, an extremely uh, articulate and well-educated man. Um, but do you believe or, in the traditional role of the avant-garde, it was using that military uh, mm -hmm. image, which is problematic, of this is the advance guard. And going ahead means new forms, new top subject matter, and therefore right now, so much theater is at once expensive. It is at once uh, imitating the entertainment industry. Um, it is designed to, uh, <laughs> yeah, what is it? You deserve a break today, you know, you know, so, <laughs> and you know, that's okay. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah, all right, yeah. you know, except that ain't, that's not what I want to do, yeah. you know? So particularly when I'm doing my work, if I'm doing commercial work, okay, I, I'm going to try to play well, so you want to buy tickets and tell your friends to go and buy tickets yeah. and so on. But when I'm making my work, I don't think I want you passive. Mm -hmm. And no, I don't want to pull you on stage and embarrass you. Yeah, I want you to come in. Do I want you to enjoy? Let me be honest here, Bill. Yeah, come kick back and enjoy. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm a, I'm a, <laughs> I am a, a, a confrontational son of a bitch, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And uh, you're, you're here. You could be somewhere else getting your psyche um, massaged, Absolutely. right? Yeah. Here, not that I want to curse or abuse you, but life didn't stop when you walked in this room. And what's worse more, the global life of which you are a part didn't stop when you came into this room. So you hear John Cage and Morton Feldman speaking, in a, obviously a very famous mm -hmm. conversation that Daniel Bernard Romain, who Cage made, also yeah, had the issue yeah Daniel, yeah. love him, uh, he put this together. Um, and they're sitting and they're talking, and I believe uh, uh, one of them, and I believe it's John, uh, Morton Feldman is, bemoaning the fact that he was on the beach and now they have radios and uh and i i he's he feels that his space is being invaded mm -hmm. and something we live with all the time yeah. now and these two esthetes uh I, I i love both of their works but these two white men mm -hmm. are sitting there and i'm thinking what in the beach if it was jones beach or whatever who were there who was around them what was the radios playing mm -hmm. and uh so john cage says well, uh, I think about um, the primitive people who would go into a cave. I know the language is all, wow. oh, and, and please, John, forgive me. If we, <laughs> but it's to hear him speak, primitive people going into a cave and drawing on the walls the, the things that frightened them or whatever. And he said, I, when I hear the radios, I just say, it, they're playing my piece. Uh, you know, because he did yeah. very famous pieces yeah. to, to radios. So there, the victory of, of the avant-garde. Yeah. He has appropriated the anxiety of his personal space being invaded, and he's now even put it in some sort of an anthropological um, aesthetic matrix mm -hmm. that the artist can't lose. Yeah. That is wonderful but it's also really disturbing to me. You said um, before that the art, and this is sticking with this theme of the artist, should be the freest of anyone in society. <laughs> yeah. And artists, you go on to say, should be thumbing their nose at all received wisdom. An artist should be sometimes literally running naked through the streets. Mm -hmm. Talk about that role uh, as you understand it, of the artist in society, well, let, let me, especially let me, a society that feels like we're regressing yeah. on issues of freedom, right, today. Yeah. Well, what, you know where it came from? It came from a very old discussion, and I don't know if you're still having it here at New mm -hmm. School, about what is the role of an artist? Should an artist be engaged? Or as the great Hannah Arendt thought, there was a, there was a peril in being engaged. If you read uh, in Men in Dark Times, mm -hmm. she thinks that Breck, his work suffered when he became political, mm -hmm. right? But people would ask me um, around the time that Arnie was uh, dying and my own posture, uh, uh, here in France, Mr. Jones, we consider you an artiste engagé, um, right? 
and really? I was oh. artiste engagé. So there's this Apollonian uh, artist that's a, yeah. above the world, and then there's transcendent, right? and then there's the engagé. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm potato picker. I'm black. Yeah. Identity politics, and that's when they said, "What should an artist do?" And that's where I said, "An artist does not have to do a goddamn thing." An artist should be, I use this language, I wanted my parents to get in there, yeah. right? I wanted the little boys from South Carolina or to hear it. They don't have to do a goddamn thing, but an artist is a person, a man, a woman, and at that time I didn't have trans in my vocabulary, mm -hmm. and now I say a trans person um, who has a particular social location. Uh, and what does that person that that artist is need to do? need to do. Mm -hmm. You know, John Cage often says, the artist does the necessary. Yeah. Okay, then what, 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 uh, so Girard trying to uh, get rights for trans people, Girard trying to, um, to correct the, the misinformation machine, um, is that what your artist is doing? Poor artists. You know, remember Maya Angelou's mm. grandma, mother telling her to put her hand yeah. in, a, in, a, in the water. Yeah. But yeah. you better, what do you believe, my brother? Yeah. Um, and this is on, seven, on my 71st birthday. I'm asking this question. I am so tired of asking it. Are you real, Bill? What do you really believe? And I used to say grandly when I came to, from upstate New York and came to the downtown and I saw everyone like doing the 60s again and everything was ironic and so on and so forth. And I said, yeah, but what are they willing to die for? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, well, yeah. it was a boorish thing to say. But you know, I still feel that. And I say to some of my colleagues, particularly those who have formal facility, people who can music uh, visualization, people who have great technical expertise, I wish you a great tragedy. Mm. What a horrible thing to say, but it's an essential thing. Because when you have a great oh. tragedy, will test why you are even here. Why don't you open a vein and get the fuck out, yeah. right? No, but if you want to stay here, now, connect that with your facility. Now we've been using, you've used it beautifully mm -hmm. several times, great art. Mm -hmm. Ah, what about just art that's good? Mm -hmm. I just want to make, want to make good art. Good. No, 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 we want to make it, it's got to be great. And by the way, what is great? Yeah. That's a whole nother interview. Yeah. <laughs> the difference between great art and good art, because I, 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 I'm, I'm tempted to go there right now, but, no, but I, I'm, I'm going to, but I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to, but I love, love the provocation. Um, there's another piece of yours. We mentioned trilogy. I want to um, talk a little bit about the deep blue sea. You've always used dance to answer the big questions, and this piece you've asked, does that we exist? Even exist, yes. yeah. yeah. Uh, and Martin Luther King uh, spoke to it in one way. Um, you've spoken about it in a very different way in this piece, and so I wonder if you could say a little bit about the piece itself. Mm -hmm. um, what, what brought it? What brought it into existence? Mm -hmm. Well, a glib uh, answer would be loneliness. My whole life. Oh wow! Okay. Feeling lonely. Mm -hmm. uh, who? Uh, once I was no longer defined by being a tribe of Estella and Gus Jones, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Who are you? Mm. You know, and the loneliness of oftentimes being in. Uh, for whatever reasons, my education. I think sexuality has something to do with mm -hmm. in. Uh, I was oftentimes the only person of color there, mm. you know? I mean, you're a unicorn, aren't you? Absolutely. You know? That's the, the word I use all the time. Yes, yes. Yeah. I didn't know at that time. Yeah. Uh, so the loneliness mm -hmm. that I was thinking, and then he is saying, Free it, like, little boy, white boys and black boys and white girls and black girls and Jews and Gentiles will hold hands and, yeah. and you can hear Mahalia, tell, oh, them yeah, yeah. tell them about the children, tell them about the children, Martin. <laughs> yeah, so the Negro spiritual, ah, let's go to the, sanct the sanctuary of the Negro spiritual. Mm -hmm. I've been buked and I've been scorned, but look, we're still here to yeah. testify and how does Maya say, and still I rise. Mm -hmm. All of that was well and good, except I wasn't sure if I was being honest about it. Mm -hmm did I really feel mm. like I was a part of the world? You know, there's the alienation that comes with identity questions. Absolutely. 
I'm part of the generation that's held accountable for identity politics. And if you feel, as I don't know if you read the New York Review of Books and the Jed Pearl, P-E-R-L, the writer there, he has written an article recently about the tyranny of relevance. The tyranny of relevance. He says that now when he goes to a show of a painting and whatever, maybe it's true in all, that you care more about who made it what their gender is, what their race is, then how they handle paint, how they handle language. He says, he said, there is a tyranny right now. And people like myself, there's open season on us because we're the ones who are, would stand on stage and speak in the first person, I, right? Yeah. And that uh, the belligerence, this, thing, this game I was playing with you, was a way of getting people to uh, have a response to you. Mm -hmm. Now, is this the same way that Lenny Bruce did yeah. In, yeah. when he was trying to pro provoke people with uh, nigger, yeah. right? Yeah. Uh, yes and no. So a lot of the, the, the Deep Blue Sea was trying to come to grips with those things by subsuming all these questions in the reality of being a part of a community. Mm -hmm. And I had been through so many <clears throat> equity, diversity, inclusion <laughs> Uh, situations at my theater mm -hmm. and on Broadway in the room in those rooms where people were angry as hell mm -hmm. because you know as a black woman I think that this line is wrong in the show or as a gay person as a queer person all of this and, and you know they were and then George Floyd blew it all up yeah. I yeah. was rapidly am still angry about that. Absolutely. Never mentioned uh, Mr. Nichols, uh, was it two weeks ago, right? Uh, I was trying to make a piece that could hear my era talking. Now, people who are my detractors say, well, you did so much damn talking yourself, man. But I was, I was the megaphone uh, quoting King. I even do his uh, I Have a Dream backwards. Um, the why? Because saying fair-minded people should really be upset that that violence is being done to his meaning. They should struggle to turn that speech around because the speech has become sometimes little more than Hallmark cards. That's right. And where That's are we right. sitting here today? Yeah. Is this Black History Month? Yeah, it is. Didn't we swear that, that we don't need Black History Month? Mm -hmm. We want Black History to be every month? Yeah. But this one just sort of sl slipped in and we're now in Black History Month. You know, month, yeah. Black History Month. What um, what advice would you have for young people today? I always like to end with um, something for our students. The advice. Yeah, I mean, uh -huh. you know, especially those who are thinking about a career mm -hmm. in the performing arts. Mm -hmm. um, what advice would you have for them today? First is to answer the question: Are you fierce? Mm -hmm. I mean, look, look, child. Are you fierce? In other words, can you step out on your truth every day? Now let's talk about your career. Mm. Once you answer that question, what do you love in the world around you? And do you want to aspire to that? Are you energetic and are you honest enough to really participate in pursuit of that thing that you love? Mm. Young choreographers say, well, I think I want to be a choreographer, but I don't know how. Well, the first thing you've got to do is start making work. Make it for your friends, show it to your friends, get fail, and then do another one. Mm -hmm. that's, the, that's one thing. And along the way, and I'm assuming you all in the faculty here, how are you going to feed yourself, dear? Yeah. How, how are you going to feed yourself? Now, when I came along, there was the, the largest of the Democrats, and we had Camelot, and so on and so forth. Uh, and as in the Kennedy White House. So there was money around for me to go to even to university on the, what we call the transitional year program. That's not, that's not so easy anymore. What, uh, so do, do you know who you are? Do you know what you love? What would you, your dream be of an enterprise? This is your career. Now go in pursuit of that because you know it will not necessarily have anything to do with feeding yourself. Yeah. Are you prepared to feed yourself? And what happens when, if you are a cisgendered person and you want to have a, a children? Mm -hmm. If you're a gay person, you want to have a, a, a companion and child? 
How will that happen? Now, is that too much to ask an 18, 19, 20-year-old? It's a lot, but it may, but it may be the truth. It, it well, may be exactly what, what folks need to hear. Yeah, yeah. Well, and I'm assuming that all of your faculty, because of the, what the youth are expected us to know, the youth will be in your face in a minute and calling you a hypocrite Absolutely. or that you're incorrect somehow. Absolutely. So your faculty must be ready to take that on and speak in the most loving and um, mm, challenging ways mm -hmm. to these young folks. That can be scary. Oh, absolutely. And here we are trying to love them, and they are frightening. You Education know? is scary. Right? Mm. Um, it's not, it shouldn't always be rainbows and sunshine. So I think it's a big part of, um, of, uh, of what I, I worry about uh, in, our, in our current moment is that in our effort to shield and protect, mm -hmm. we may also um, not always be exposing our students to some of the hard truths that we also need for them to learn to prepare them to enter the world, right? And don't you just hate what's yeah. going on in, in terms of the, uh, what you should, the government's going to say what you should and should not teach them? It's, because if you teach scary. them certain things of American history, you might make people upset. Yeah. Lord have mercy, honey. Strange times, my friend, yes. strange times. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I am delighted that you are here with us in them and sharing uh, your brilliance, your work, mm -hmm. your generosity of spirit. Can't tell you how much it means. Well, we appreciate thank you very you. much. Thank, thank, you. You. thank you, thank you, thank you, absolutely. Thank you.